What's up, y'all? This is Fiveable. We're talking about Colombian Exchange tonight. So this looks like a smaller group while we're live, um, which is fair. You know, winter break is just ending. And I know everyone's like stressed out about going back to school. So that's cool. So if you're coming in and you're watching the replay, that's awesome. You can still hit us up in the chat, say hello. Uh, I'm going to be sharing my screen. Let's see. We're going to talk about... Let me find my tab. Here we go. <clears throat> All right, here we go. So pulling up slides for Columbian Exchange. We posted as soon as this is over so that you can refer back to these whenever you want. Okay, so. All right, just opening this up. Okay, so if you're joining, hit us up in the chat, say hello, um, you know, let us know you're here. You can ask any questions in the question box below, and I'll make sure to answer all those, um, any questions that come up. All right, so one second, I'm just trying to organize my screen here. All right. <clears throat> Oops, not the Mongols. All right, so we're talking about Key Concept 4.1. So this is the Colombian Exchange. It's really like all about globalization and it includes like the silver trade, right? The flow of silver that was happening between the, between Asia and the Americas um, and in Europe. And you really have this just like massive connection of the world, right? Like never before had the entire world been connected in um, in in trade, like with Indian Ocean trade, with Silk Roads, with Mediterranean Ocean, um, you know, Trans-Saharan Desert, like those things were not global. They connected massive amounts of people and goods and ideas, but it wasn't the whole world. You didn't have the Americas included. Um, really, uh, like David Christian kind of talks about in big history, there being these world zones. And it's really not like it's not unlike almost separate planets, right? Like what was happening in the Americas was completely separate from what was happening in Afro-Eurasia uh, and those things just did not connect. And so now with globalized trade, with the Colombian exchange, they're connecting. You have these like worlds colliding and for the first time ever, the whole world is going to connect um, through trade. And obviously that's going to completely change change the game for, oh, looks like I've frozen here. There we go. All right, so <clears throat> let's get into it. Key concept 4.1. So like why were the Europeans wanting to explore in the first place? The, you can basically narrow this down to those like three Gs, um, God, glory, gold, and that's will come up on this list. But these are sort of like the causes, like why do you have these explorers? Ultimately, Italy had kind of a monopoly on trade between Europe and Asia because they had the Mediterranean ports. So, you know, that all that region in between, that was the sort of like the middle, right? Like that was kind of the gateway to Europe and they had control of that. And so in Western Europe, Spain, Portugal and France, um, you know, obviously the British, the Dutch, they're now trying to keep up. And right? now they need a new route because otherwise... Italy's got the monopoly and they're not going to make any money off of it. So they got to search for new routes. And now that there's new technologies that are making that possible, there's a reason to explore. This is happening. This is the cause for it. So the other reasons for this, though, are like that, that idea of God, right? So spreading Christianity is, is one of the causes for exploration. Um, and then searching for gold and silver overseas. Um, just trying to get rich, right? These are like like get rich quick schemes. Like if I can find a quick route, I will make more money faster. So that's kind of your why. I think uh, a lot, honestly, there's been essays about the Columbian Exchange a lot on the exams. Um, they've covered effects. They've covered changes and continuities in on, on the Columbian Exchange, um, causes of trade in, in this time. I would be really familiar with this time period and especially 
through those historical thinking skills. And so this is really about causes, the slide, and I'm going to really get into a lot of the effects, especially like as they relate to each region. And then you could get an essay that's like comparing the effects of the regions. So this is a popular topic. Don't be surprised if it comes up again um, in LEQs or somewhere. All right, so I'm gonna stay hydrated like Mr. Ritchie. So um, these are some of the major explorers. Um, you know, AP World is not AP European history. You don't have to know a lot of the ins and outs and the backgrounds of these explorers, but they're like part of the story. So, you know, in order for these connections to happen on a larger scale, there needs to be like someone to go do it first. So you've got um, Henry the Navigator, who is like from Portugal, going to West Africa. Columbus goes to the Americas. Vasco da Gama goes to India. So you do have these explorers kind of heading out in different directions. You know, like obviously Columbus has like the namesake of this time, the, the Colombian exchange, you know, he's the one that is on this voyage that is connecting the Americas and Afro-Eurasia. He's not the first to do it, but his, this moment is, is it, right? Like this is now, it is connected and it is a turning point. It is maybe one of the most important turning points in world history. So Columbus gets, you know, kind of credit for that because that's where, you know, that's, that's the line of it. So, um, but of course, like, you know, like Columbus as a historical figure is questionable, you know, there's genocide and like other horrible things that he did. Um, but he gets the namesake here. So no Columbus, no, this turning point, this year, 1492, um, there aren't a lot of dates in AP World that you really absolutely 100% need to remember this year, but this is one of them. You really should know the year 1492. It's an easy one to remember, right? Columbus sailed the ocean blue. This is the one to know. So some of the new technologies that they had at this time um, were really making trade a lot easier. So for example, the Astrolab was getting even better. Right? This is about navigation, better maps, that cart cartography. Um, understanding of the wind patterns was even better. And then the caravels, these are these small ships is what they look like. And so the small ships are important because they can travel greater distances and faster because of their size and speed. So the Columbian Exchange itself is the circulation of goods from, you know, within the Atlantic, right? Like, the, like this is... This is specifically what it's talking about. The Columbian Exchange is the the Atlantic trade, this first one right here. And so what you have is that triangle trade. And I'll show um, a map of this in a second. But basically, you have the New World, which is the Americas, and the Old World, which is Afro-Eurasia. And there's a lot of coming, you know, a lot connecting the two. And so there's there's goods, there's disease, there's people, there's ideas being transferred between both sides. So from the New World, so from the Americas to the Old World, you have things like corn, potatoes, cocoa, chocolate. From the Old World, some of the you know big things that you have are disease, which wipes out many of the Native Americans. Um, you have the slave trade and the, all the slave populations. And you have sugar. And so sugar, I mean, imagine life without sugar, right? So, um, it, you know, some of those like early... Um, like pre-Columbian uh, um, like leaders, anyone in the Americas who would, they would drink this like chocolate shake almost, but it didn't have sugar in it. It was very bitter. So, you know, it's like they had chocolate, but no sugar. So think about how things connect and why this is such an important moment for even like history of food. The other major circulation of goods that you have is the silver trade. So you've got this silver that's coming to the Amer from the Americas, from places like Potosi, from those mines going to Asia and the Europeans are transporting the silver between the countries. Um, and so this is another massive circulation of goods, right? So it's global, it's a lot of movement um, and it's got a lot of effects because of that. And that's something that we're going to take a deep dive into. 
So this is a map that you see, pretty common map for the Columbian Exchange. It's pretty basic, right? Because it's just kind of showing here's how the movement of goods looked for the Columbian Exchange. So you've got, you know, all kinds of goods coming New World, remember New World is Americas, to the Old World. Things like tobacco, pumpkin, squash, cocoa, peanuts, potatoes, corn, all the stuff that never existed before in the in the old world is now, now appearing, right? And like think about all the types of different foods that you relate to, like like Italy, for example, right? Like today you can't even imagine Italian food without tomatoes. Um, but it didn't exist, right? So now we have the tomato everywhere, but before there wasn't. Then, of course, from the old world into the Americas, you've got coffee, peaches, olives, um, we have sugar, grains. Livestock is super important, right? This, like, cattle, sheep, pig, horse. The horse itself, um, you know, that alone, like, a lot of why you don't have the same type of, like, massive trade trade networks in the Americas before the Columbian Exchange, part of that is 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 like a north-south issue because the Americas are are not are are more you know north-south layout rather than Afro-Eurasia, which is more east-west. And so because you have this north-south you know pattern, it's harder to travel because you're you're going along these different latitudes and it makes it much more difficult to travel long distances. Um, and so horses are going to change a lot of that. So like a lot of the Native American tribes adopt horses into their culture, into their politics and economy and just all of it. It's a big part of their of their lifestyles after the horse ab- arrives in the Americas. It wasn't there before. And the second thing here that's the most or the third most important here is is disease. So like there's a lot of new diseases that the natives to the Americas had never come in contact to, like, right? Like they hadn't, there was no immunity. There was no way for them to, you know, stay without catching that disease. And it was killing a lot of people very rapidly. And so this is called the great dying. And it's like 90% of the populations in the Americas um, at this time were wiped out. So diseases were were massive to, to spread. Disease that spread from the Americas to the new old world included things like syphilis. So, so I made this chart because this is, I think, one of the most important things that you could know. Because before on the test, they've asked some form of this question on an essay several times. Like, if you look back at all the past essays that have ever been asked, you'll see examples um, of this exact type prompt. So, in some way, they'll ask either... Like, what were the effects in this region? Or they'll ask, compare the effects or the compare the changes. Um, Anything like that. You can do, you know, think about all the different ways that you could be asked to basically analyze this chart in an essay. So to kind of like take you through it. So let's just kind of go through the Americas. So if you're living in the Americas, how did your life change as a result of the Columbian exchange? Well, economically, um, coerced labor, these systems are going to be much more, uh, much more complicated and, um, just a lot bigger. So the encomienda system is one of those. Um, but in general, there's like all these different coercive labor systems, um, where you have, you know, people being forced to work. So like natives being forced to work, work, people being brought to the Americas, like slaves from Africa being forced to work. And so that is an economic change. Other changes are these cash crops that are coming out of the Americas are are making the like colonists very wealthy. Um, and that kind of changes the economy of the Americas. The silver trade in particular, right? That's a huge piece of the economy there. You know, it's not like the people of the Americas are benefiting from that but it's changing the economic, like shifting the economy of the Americas. Politically, these the massive empires that existed, like the Aztecs and the Incas, they fall, and they fall very quickly because of disease. Um, you know, even though they had 
25,000 um, or more people, it, it still was not able to like withhold, withstand all the disease that was brought in. All the different colonies that were established in the Americas after the fact, this changes the political landscape. You know, it takes away the like autonomy of Native American tribes because now you have colonizers coming in and taking the land. Demographically, so demographically would be anything like, in you know, basically like what does the makeup of the people look like, the populations? Population is decreasing like insanely fast in the Americas. And that's because of disease. Environmentally, lots of new changes, new crops, you know, new goods. We kind of looked through a lot of those ones in the last slide. And then like culturally, socially, you've got these, these new, um, this, this, the castas, the, and we're going to talk about that a lot more next week. But essentially, you have these new um, levels of like uh, racial hierarchies, right? So you have, you know, instead of there just being natives, there's now like basically the whiter you were, the higher up on the hierarchy you were, the darker you were, the lower you were on the hierarchy. And so the, all these different castas meant something in terms of who you could marry, who you could be around, what job you could have. Um, and that changes the like cultural makeup of society. And then the second thing is syncretic religions. So things like, um, uh, Vodun in the Americas, which would have been the uh, combination of West African like spirituality and Christianity like blending together. You also have the um, the Caribbean. Uh, what was it called? I'm like losing my words. The I have it on the other slide. I'll go back to it when I go back to the other slide. Okay, in Africa, big changes. The slave trade is massive. Um, it is something that the African empires are getting in as well. You know, they're not, they're part of it. They're selling slaves and being a part of that system in exchange for guns. And the slave trade in it of itself could be listed in every single one of these as an effect because it's going to have a massive effect on different regions, obviously, like in terms of just makeup of population. Um, and the effects of culture and loss of native culture. Then you've got the colonial administration that comes in, same as, as the Americas, right? So like Portugal, for example, is going to have colonized what would be like modern day, like Mozambique and modern day Angola. And so like in Angola, you have these, this massive rich history of, you know, like Queen Nzinga and, and like all these different stories that are attached to that. Um, but at this point, you've got, you know, Portugal coming in and taking taking ownership of that. And so the political makeup of Africa is going to start to change. The population in Africa is going to increase. Even though a lot of slaves are taken, the food that comes into Africa is more powerful on the on the population as a whole. And we've talked about this all the time. More food equals more people, always. Every time, more food, more people. And the amount of food coming into Africa, the, the maize, the, you know, um, what else is important? Potatoes. Some of this just like these staple items that make food so much more in a, in a surplus. There's so much more of it. So population will increase. In some villages, in some regions, Yes, population will decrease because of the slave trade, but as a whole, the population of Africa increases immensely. Another demographic feature, though, is the gender imbalance. Most of the slaves that were taken were men, and so that leaves a lot of women, a lot more women than men, behind. So you've got this gender imbalance. It's going to have a massive in impact on the population. So again, all this new food that's super important is coming in, changing the population. The syncretic religion, same thing, right? Like Vodun, like we talked about before. Um, and Europe is is very similar to Africa in these effects. I mean, economically, they're just like making it rain money. They're making a ton of money off of everybody, off of the cash crops, off of all these different colonies, the silver trade, just all of it. So 
their economy is thriving after this. Um, politically, these empires are extending. So, you know, these sea empires, the British Empire, the French Empire, the Dutch, the um, the Spanish, the Portuguese, they're, they're massively spread out now. Population of Europe increases dramatically because of food. Same thing, right? It's, it's massively increasing. Uh, and then, you know, you see all that new, the new, the, you know, new products that come in. Um, and then social, culturally, the spread of Christianity would be an important piece here, um, just as having an effect on their society. Excuse me. So I would really suggest um, memorizing this chart as you're studying. So whenever you're coming in to watch this, you're watching this replay, know this chart. This is like key, y'all. Because I guarantee you, you're going to get some kind of question about the Columbian Exchange. It may not be a whole essay, but it'll be on the test. And it's like, it just perfectly fits into all the historical thinking skills. And I think College Board really loves it. So, you know, be ready to be tested on this. So the question of like, how did Europe pay for all of this? Because exploring is not cheap. It's not free. And so you got to find ways to pay for it. The joint stock companies were, were were kind of their answer at this point. So joint stock companies, it's almost like an early version of like crowdfunding. So if I want to set up, you know, a trading system, you know, if I'm going to just put in my own money into the ship and the ship sinks, I lose everything. But if me and a bunch of other people pool our resources in together and we have our ships together and a ship sinks, well, at least I haven't lost everything. We all lost a little bit. So this is that's like a really basic explanation of joint stock companies. But you know, these were the two like kind of biggest ones: the VOC, the British East India Company, um, that are just kind of ruling the world. Like they take their monopolizing trade essentially. Um, all right. So you know, so like we talked about the impact of globalization, but just again, you know, spread of religion in general. Islam is continuing to spread, uh, especially like throughout Southeast Asia um, into, right, like places like, you know, Indonesia, you know, anywhere in Southeast Asia. Uh, and then you've got like Christianity spreading all through the Americas. Buddhism is spreading and continuing to spread into China and into Southeast Asia. Syncretic religions, Vodun, that's sort of like voodoo in the Caribbean. Cult of saints, that's what I wasn't thinking about before. Cult of Saints is like, um, uh, I've got like flu brain. So, um, Cult of Saints is that like combination of like Native American cultures with Christianity. So you've got this like connection of the two that sort of blend together to create something new. Uh, and then Sikhism in India is, is starting in this time period as well. Sikhism is a blending of, uh, Islam and Hinduism. Uh, the other pieces, because of basically when things are going good, when when people are are fed and are making money, then they turn to things like art. Right, I've got time. I'm I I don't have to worry about my, you know, well being, my livelihood. I know that I'm going to be okay, and so I can work. I can do art, and so there's there's really big innovations in art that will change the trajectory of history. Things like the Renaissance, right? That like rebirth of Greek and Roman ideas of those, like the works of paint, paintings and literature. Um, you know, you have like um, Shakespeare, right? You've got woodblock printing and Kabuki theater. I mean, it's everywhere. You're seeing art be a bigger part of life everywhere. Whereas like during, you know, the like post classical era that like dark ages, like you don't have all of that much. You have a lot of art happening in um, like the Islamic world in China, but like out of Europe, for example. And so then when you get the Renaissance, it is this rebirth. And so that will eventually lead us to the enlightenment, which will then lead us to revolutions and so on. So, not too, too much left. Um, if Whenever you're watching this, feel free to add questions um, and add, you know, put 
post anything you want, and I'll come back in and answer them as we go. Uh, looks like we've got, yeah, that's pretty much, that's pretty much it, y'all. So, okay, so that's globalization. Um, again, you know, come back in and ask any questions. I know that we've got 17 weeks until the exam season begins, and so, you know, wherever, you're, again, whenever you're watching this, post questions, ask me to help you out. I'm here for you. Next week, we're going to be talking about um, race and class. Uh, that's all 4.2. And uh, Mr. Laster is going to come in and do that. The week after that, we'll be on 4.3. That would be your land and sea empires. And and then we're going to do some DBQ practice. So if you have any requests for us, um, you can tweet at us at thinkfiveable. You can also post it here in a question or in the chat. Uh, and we'll be sure to make sure you guys are ready. So uh, that's it for tonight, y'all. See you later.